Essay number one of Unto This Last. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unto This Last, Four Essays on the First Principles of Political Economy by John Ruskin. Essay number one, The Roots of Honor. Among the delusions which at different periods have possessed themselves of the minds of large masses of the human race, perhaps the most curious, Certainly the least creditable is the modern soi disant science of political economy based on the idea that an advantageous code of social action may be determined irrespectively of the influence of social affection. Of course, as in the instances of alchemy, astrology, witchcraft, and other such popular creeds, political economy has a plausible idea at the root of it. The social affections, says the economist, are accidental and disturbing elements in human nature. But avarice and desire of progress are constant elements. Let us eliminate the inconstance and, considering the human being merely as a covetous machine, examine by what laws of labor, purchase, and sale the greatest accumulative result in wealth is obtainable. Those laws once determined, it will be for each individual afterwards to introduce as much of the disturbing affectionate element as he chooses, and to determine for himself the result on the new conditions supposed. This would be a perfectly logical and successful method of analysis if the accidentals afterwards to be introduced were of the same nature as the powers first examined. Supposing a body in motion to be influenced by constant and inconstant forces it is usually the simplest body it is usually the simplest way of examining its course to trace it first under the persistent conditions and afterwards introduce the causes of variation but the disturbing elements in the social problem are not of the same nature as the constant ones they alter the essence of the creature under examination the moment they are added they operate not mathematically but chemically introducing conditions which render all our previous knowledge unavailable we made learned experiments upon pure nitrogen and have convinced ourselves that it is a very manageable gas but behold the thing which we have practically to deal with is its chloride and this the moment we touch it on our established principles sends us and our apparatus through the ceiling observe i neither Pune, nor doubt the conclusion of the science if its terms are accepted. I am simply uninterested in them, as I should be in those of a science of gymnastics which assumed that men had no skeletons. It might be shown on that supposition that it would be advantageous to roll the students up into pellets, flatten them into cakes, or stretch them into cables, and that when these results were effected, the reinsertion of the skeleton would be attended with various inconveniences to their constitution. The reasoning might be admirable, the conclusions true, and the science deficient only in applicability. Modern political economy stands on a precisely similar basis. Assuming not that the human being has no skeleton, but that it is all skeleton, it founds an ossifant theory of progress on this negation of soul and having shown the utmost that may be made of bones and constructed a number of interesting geometrical figures with the death's head and humeri successfully proves the inconvenience of the reappearance of a soul among these corpuscular structures i do not deny the truth of this theory i simply deny its applicability to the present phase of the world this inapplicability has been curiously manifested during the embarrassment caused by the late strikes of our workmen. Here occurs one of the simplest cases, in a pertinent and positive form, of the first vital problem which political economy has to deal with, the relation between employer and employed, and at a severe crisis when lives and multitudes and wealth and masses are at stake, the political economists are helpless, practically mute. No demonstrable solution of the difficulty can be given by them, such as may convince or calm the opposing parties. Obstinately, the masters take one view of the matter, obstinately, the operatives another, and no political science can set them at one. 
it would be strange if it could it being not by science of any kind that men were ever intended to be set at one disputant after disputant vainly strives to show that the interests of the masters are or are not antagonistic to those of the men none of the pleaders ever seeming to remember that it does not absolutely or always follow that the person must be antagonistic because their interests are if there is only a crust of bread in the house and mother and children are starving their interests are not the same if the mother eats it the children want it if the children eat it the mother must go hungry to her work yet it does not necessarily follow that there will be antagonism between them that they will fight for the crust and that the mother being strongest will get it and eat it neither in any other case whatever the relations of the person may be can it be assumed for certain that because their interests are diverse they must necessarily regard each other with hostility and use violence or cunning to obtain the advantage even if this were so and it were as just as it is convenient to consider men as actuated by no other moral influences than those which affect rats or swine the logical conditions of the question are still indeterminable it can never be shown generally either that the interests of master and laborer are alike or that they are opposed for according to circumstances they may be either it is indeed always the interest of both that the work should be rightly done and a just price obtained for it but in the division of profits the gain of the one may or may not be the loss of the other it is not the master's interest to pay wages so low as to leave the men sickly and depressed nor the workman's interest to be paid high wages if the smallness of the master's profit hinders him from enlarging his business or conducting it in a safe and liberal way a stoker ought not to desire high pay if the company is too poor to keep the engine wheels in repair and the varieties of circumstances which influence these reciprocal interests are so endless that all endeavor to deduce rules of action from balance of expediency is in vain and it is meant to be in vain for no human actions were ever intended by the maker of men to be guided by balances of expediency but by balances of justice he has therefore rendered all endeavors to determine expediency futile forevermore no man ever knew or can know what will be the ultimate result to himself or to others of any given line of conduct but every man may know and most of us do know what is a just and unjust act and all of us may know also that the consequences of justice will be ultimately the best possible both to others and ourselves though we can neither say what is best or how it is likely come to pass i have said balances of justice meaning in the term justice to include affection such affection as one man owes to another all right relations between master and operative and all their best interests ultimately depend on these we shall find the best and simplest illustration of the relations of master and operative in the position of domestic servants we will suppose that the master of a household desires only to get as much work out of his servants as he can at the rate of wages he gives he never allows them to be idle feeds them as poorly and lodges them as ill as they will endure and in all things pushes his requirements to the exact point beyond which he cannot go without forcing the servant to leave him in doing this there is no violation on his part of what is commonly called justice he agrees with the domestic for his whole time ad service and takes them the limits of hardship in treatment being fixed by the practice of other masters in his neighborhood that is to say by the current rate of wages for domestic labor if the servant can get a better place he is free to take one and the master can only tell what is the real market value of his labor by requiring as much as he will give this is the politico-economical view of the case according to the doctors of that science who assert that by this procedure the greatest average of work will be obtained from the servant and therefore the greatest benefit to the community and through the community by reversion to the servant himself that however is not so it would be so if the servant were an engine of which the motive power was steam magnetism gravitation or any other agent of calculable force but he being on the contrary an engine whose motive 
power is a soul, the force of this very peculiar agent, as an unknown quantity, enters into all the political economists' equations without his knowledge, and falsifies every one of their results. The largest quantity of work will not be done by this curious engine for pay, or under pressure, or by help of any kind of fuel which may be supplied by the cauldron. It will be done only when the motive force, that is to say, the will or spirit of the creature, is brought to its greatest strength by its own proper fuel, namely by the affections. It may indeed happen, and does happen often, that if the master is a man of sense and energy, a large quantity of material work may be done under mechanical pressure, enforced by strong will and guided by wise method. Also it may happen, and does happen often, that if the master is indolent and weak, however good-natured, a very small quantity of work, and that bad, may be produced by the servant's undirected strength and contemptuous gratitude. But the universal law of the matter is that, assuming any given quantity of energy and sense in master and servant, the greatest material result obtainable by them will be, not through antagonism to each other, but through affection for each other, and that if the master, instead of endeavouring to get as much work as possible from the servant, seeks rather to render his appointed and necessary work beneficial to him, and to forward his interests in all just and wholesome ways, the real amount of work ultimately done, or of good rendered, by the person so cared for, will indeed be the greatest possible. Observe, I say, of good rendered, for a servant's work is not necessarily or always the best thing he can give his master. But good of all kinds, whether in material service, in protective watchfulness of his master's interests and credit, or in joyful readiness to seize unexpected and irregular occasions of help. Nor is this one whit less generally true, because indulgence will be frequently abused, and kindness met with ingratitude. For the servant who, gently treated, is ungrateful, treated urgently, will be revengeful. And the man who is dishonest to a liberal master will be injurious to an unjust one. In any case, and with any person, this unselfish treatment will produce the most effective return. Observe, I am here considering the affections wholly as a mode of power, not at all as things in themselves desirable or noble, or in any other way abstractly good. I look at them simply as an anomalous force, rendering every one of the ordinary political economists' calculations nugatory while, even if he desired to introduce this new element into his estimates, he has no power of dealing with it. For the affections only become a true motive power when they ignore every other motive and condition of political economy. Treat the servant kindly, with the idea of turning his gratitude to account, and you will get, as you deserve, no gratitude nor any value for your kindness, but treat him kindly without any economical purpose, and all economical purposes will be answered. In this, as in other matters, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Who loses it shall find it. Note 1. The difference between the two modes of treatment and between their effective material results may be seen very accurately by a comparison of the relations of Esther and Charlie in Bleak House with those of Miss Brass and Marchioness in Master Humphrey's Clock. The essential value and truth of Dickens's writings have been unwisely lost sight of by many thoughtful persons, merely because he presents his truth with some color of caricature. Unwisely because Dickens's caricature, though often gross, is never mistaken. Allowing for this manner of telling them, the things he tells us are always true. I wish that he could think it right to limit his brilliant exaggeration to works written only for public amusement, and when he takes up a subject of high national importance, such as which he handled in hard times, that he would use severer and more accurate analysis. The usefulness of that work, to my mind, in several respects the greatest he has written, is with many persons seriously diminished because Mr. Bounderby 
is a dramatic monster instead of a characteristic example of a worldly master and stephen blackpool a dramatic perfection instead of a characteristic example of an honest workman but let us not lose the use of dickens's wit and insight because he chooses to speak in a circle of stage fire he is entirely right in his main drift and purpose in every book he has written and all of them but especially hard times should be studied with close and earnest care by persons interested in social questions they will find much that is partial and because partial apparently unjust but if they examine all the evidence on the other side which dickens seems to overlook it will appear after all their trouble that his view was finally the right one grossly and sharply told end of note one the next clearest and simplest example of relation between master and operative is that which exists between the commander of a regiment and his men supposing the officer only desires to apply the rules of discipline so as with least trouble to himself to make the regiment most effective he will not be able by any rules or administration of rules on this selfish principle to develop the full strength of his subordinates if a man of sense and firmness he may as the former instance produce a better result than would be obtained by the irregular kindnesses of a weak officer but let the sense and firmness be the same in both cases and assuredly the officer who has the most direct personal relations with his men the most care for their interests and the most value for their lives will develop their effective strength through their affection for his own purpose and trust in his character to a degree wholly unattainable by other means this law applies still more stringently as the numbers concerned are larger a charge may often be successful though the men dislike their officers a battle has rarely been won unless they love their general Passing from these simple examples to the more complicated relations existing between a manufacturer and his workmen, we are met first by certain curious difficulties resulting, apparently, from a harder and colder state of moral elements. It is easy to imagine an enthusiastic affection existing among soldiers for the colonel. Not so easy to imagine an enthusiastic affection among cotton spinners for the proprietor of the mill. A body of men associated for purposes of robbery as a highland clan in ancient times shall be animated by perfect affection and every member of it be ready to lay down his life for the life of his chief but a band of men associated for purposes of legal production and accumulation is usually animated it appears by no such emotions and none of them are in any wise willing to give his life for the life of his chief not only are we met by this apparent anomaly in moral matters but by others connected with it in administration of system for a servant or a soldier is engaged at a definite rate of wages for a definite period but a workman at a rate of wages variable according to the demand for labor and with the risk of being at any time thrown out of his situation by chance of trade now as under these contingencies no action of the affections can take place but only an explosive action of disaffections two points offer themselves for consideration in the matter the first how far the rate of wages may be so regulated as not to vary with the demand for labor the second how far it is possible that bodies of workmen may be engaged and maintained at such fixed rate of wages whatever the state of trade may be without enlarging or diminishing their number so as to give them permanent interest in the establishment with which they are connected like that of the domestic servants in an old family or an esprit de corps like that of the soldiers in a crack regiment the first question is i say how far it may be possible to fix the rate of wages irrespectively of demand for labor perhaps one of the most curious facts in the history of human error is the denial by the common political economists of the possibility of thus regulating wages while for all the important and much of the unimportant labor on earth wages are already so regulated we do not sell our prime ministership by dutch auction nor on the decease of a bishop whatever may be the general advantages of simony do we yet offer his diocese to the 
clergyman who will take the episcopacy at the lowest contract. We, with exquisite sagacity of political economy, do indeed sell commissions, but not openly, generalships. Sick, we do not inquire for a physician who takes less than a guinea. Litigious, we never think of reducing six and eight pence to four and six pence. Caught in a shower, we do not canvass the cabman to find one who values his driving at less than sixpence a mile. It is true that in all these cases there is, and in every conceivable case there must be, ultimate reference to the presumed difficulty of the work, or number of candidates for the office. If it were thought that the labor necessary to make a good physician would be gone through by a sufficient number of students, with the prospect of only a half-guinea fees, public consent would soon withdraw the unnecessary half-guinea. In this ultimate sense, the price of labor is indeed always regulated by the demand for it, but so far as the practical and immediate administration of the matter is regarded, the best labor always has been, and is, as all labor ought to be, paid by an invariable standard. What, the reader perhaps answers amazedly, pay good and bad workmen alike? Certainly. The difference between one's prelate's sermons and his successors, or between one physician's opinion and another's, is far greater as respects the qualities of mind involved, and far more important in result to you personally than the difference between good and bad laying of bricks, though that is greater than most people suppose. Yet you pay with equal fee contentedly the good and the bad workmen upon your soul, and the good and bad workmen upon your body. Much more may you pay contentedly with equal fees the good and bad workmen upon your house. Nay, but I choose my physician and my clergyman thus, indicating my sense of the quality of their work. By all means, also, choose your bricklayer. That is the proper reward of the good workman to be chosen. The natural and right system respecting all labor is that it should be paid at a fixed rate, but the good workman employed and the bad workman unemployed. The false, unnatural, and destructive system is when the bad workman is allowed to offer his work at half price, and either take the place of the good or force him by his competition to work for an inadequate sum. This equality of wages, then, being the first object toward which we have to discover the directest available road. The second is, as above stated, that of maintaining constant numbers of workmen in employment, whatever may be the accidental demand for the article they produce. I believe the sudden and extensive inequalities of demand, which necessarily arise in the mercantile operations of an active nation, constitute the only essential difficulty which has to be overcome in a just organization of labor. The subject opens into too many branches to admit of being investigated in a paper of this kind, but the following general facts bearing on it may be noted. The wages which enable any workman to live are necessarily higher if his work is liable to intermission than if it is assured and continuous, and however severe the struggle for work may become, the general law will always hold that men must get more daily pay if, on the average, they can only calculate on work three days a week than they would require if they were sure of work six days a week. Supposing that a man cannot live on less than a shilling a day, his seven shillings he must get, either for three days violent work or six days deliberate work. The tendency of all modern mercantile operations is to throw both wages and trade into the form of a lottery and to make the workman's pay depend on intermittent exertion and the principal's profit on dexterously used chance. In what partial degree, I repeat, this may be necessary in consequence of the activities of modern trade, I do not here investigate, contenting myself with the fact that in its fatalist aspects it is assuredly unnecessary and results merely from love of gambling on the part of the masters and from ignorance and sensuality in the men. The masters cannot bear to let any opportunity of gain escape them and frantically rush at every gap and breach in the walls of fortune, raging to be rich and affronting with impatient covetousness every risk of ruin. 
while the men prefer three days of violent labor and three days of drunkenness to six days of moderate work and wise rest. There is no way in which a principal, who really desires to help his workmen, may do it more effectually than by checking these disorderly habits both in himself and them. Keeping his own business operations on a scale which will enable him to pursue them securely, not yielding to temptations of precarious gain, and at the same time leading his workmen into regular habits of labor and life, either by inducing them rather to take low wages in the form of a fixed salary than high wages, subject to the chance of their being thrown out of work, or, if this be impossible, by discouraging the system of violent exertion for nominally high day wages and leading the men to take lower pay for more regular labor. In effecting any radical changes of this kind, doubtless there would be great inconvenience and loss incurred by all the originators of a movement. That which can be done with perfect convenience and without loss is not always the thing that most needs to be done, or which we are most imperatively required to do. I have already alluded to the difference hitherto existing between regiments of men associated for purposes of violence and for purposes of manufacture, in that the former appear capable of self-sacrifice, the latter not, which singular fact is the real reason of the general lowness of estimate in which the profession of commerce is held as compared with that of arms. Philosophically, it does not at first sight appear reasonable, many writers have endeavored to prove it unreasonable, that a peaceable and rational person whose trade is buying and selling should be held in less honor than an unpeaceable and often irrational person whose trade is slaying. Nevertheless, the consent of mankind has always, in spite of the philosophers, given precedence to the soldier, and this is right. For the soldier's trade, verily and essentially, is not slaying, but being slain. This, without well knowing its own meaning, the world honors it for. A bravo's trade is slaying, but the world has never respected bravos more than merchants. The reason it honors the soldier is because he holds his life at the service of the state. Reckless he may be, fond of pleasure or adventure, all kinds of by-motives, and mean impulses may have determined the choice of his profession, and may affect, to all appearance exclusively, his daily conduct in it. But our estimate of him is based on this ultimate fact, of which we are well assured, that put him in a fortress breach, with all the pleasures of the world behind him, and only death and his duty in front of him, he will keep his face to the front, and he knows that his choice may be put to him at any moment, and has beforehand taken his part, virtually takes such part continually, does, in reality, die daily. Not less is the respect we pay to the lawyer and physician, founded ultimately on their self-sacrifice. Whatever the learning or acuteness of a great lawyer, our chief respect for him depends on our belief that, set in a judge's seat, he will strive to judge justly, come of it what may. Could we suppose that he would take bribes and use his acuteness and legal knowledge to give plausibility to iniquitous decisions, no degree of intellect would win for him our respect. Nothing will win it short of our tacit conviction that in all important acts of his life justice is first with him, his own interest second. In the case of a physician, the ground of the honor we render him is clearer still. Whatever his science, we would shrink from him in horror if we found him regard his patients merely as subjects to experiment upon much more if we found that, receiving bribes from persons interested in their deaths, he was using his best skill to give poison in the mask of medicine. Finally, the principle holds with utmost clearness as it respects clergymen. No goodness of disposition will excuse want of science in a physician or shrewdness in an advocate. 
but a clergyman even though his power of intellect be small is respected on the presumed ground of his unselfishness and serviceableness now there can be no question that the tact foresight decision and other mental powers required for the successful management of a large mercantile concern if not such as could be compared with those of a great lawyer general or divine would at least match the general conditions of mind required in the subordinate officers of a ship or of a regiment or in the curate of a country parish if therefore all the efficient members of the so-called liberal professions are still somehow in public estimate of honor preferred before the head of a commercial firm the reason must lie deeper than in the measurement of their several powers of mind and the essential reason for such preference will be found to lie in the fact that the merchant is presumed to act always selfishly his work may be very necessary to the community but the motive of it is understood to be wholly personal the merchant's first object in all his dealings must be the public believe to get as much for himself and leave as little to his neighbor or customer as possible enforcing this upon him by political statute as the necessary principle of his action recommending it to him on all occasions and themselves reciprocally adopting it proclaiming vociferously for law of the universe that a buyer's function is to cheapen and a seller's to cheat the public nevertheless involuntarily condemn the man of commerce for his compliance with their own statement and stamp him forever as belonging to an inferior grade of human personality this they will find eventually they must give up doing they must not cease to condemn selfishness but they will have to discover a kind of commerce which is not exclusively selfish or rather they will have to discover that there never was or can be any other kind of commerce that this which they have called commerce was not commerce at all but cozening and that a true merchant differs as much from a merchant according to the laws of modern political economy as the hero of the excursion from autolycus they will find that commerce is an occupation which gentlemen will every day see more need to engage in rather than in the business of talking to men or slaying them that in true commerce as in true preaching or true fighting it is necessary to admit the idea of occasional voluntary loss that sixpences have to be lost as well as lives under the sense of duty that the market may have its martyrdoms as well as the pulpit and trade its heroisms as well as war may have in the final issue must have and only has not had yet because men of heroic temper have always been misguided in their youth into other fields not recognizing what is in our days perhaps the most important of all fields so that while many a jealous person loses his life in trying to teach the form of a gospel very few will lose a hundred pounds in showing the practice of one the fact is that people never have had clearly explained to them the true functions of a merchant with respect to other people i should like the reader to be very clear about this five great intellectual professions relating to daily necessities of life have hitherto existed three exist necessarily in every civilized nation the soldier's profession is to defend it the pastors to teach it the physicians to keep it in health the lawyers to enforce justice in it the merchants to provide for it and the duty of all these men is on due occasion to die for it on due occasion namely the soldier rather than leave his post in battle the physician rather than leave his post in plague the pastor rather than teach falsehood the lawyer rather than countenance injustice the merchant what is his due occasion of death it is the main question for the merchant as for all of us for truly the man who does not know when to die does not know how to live observe the merchant's function or manufacturers for in a broad sense in which it is here used the word must be understood to include both is to provide for the nation it is no more his function to get profit for himself out of that provision than it is a clergyman's function to get his stipend 
This stipend is a due and necessary adjunct, but not the object of his life. If he be a true clergyman any more than his fee, or honorarium, is the object of life to a true physician. Neither is his fee the object of life to a true merchant. All three, if true men, have a work to be done, irrespective of fee, to be done even at any cost, or for quite the contrary of fee. The pastor's function being to teach, the physicians to heal, and the merchants, as I have said, to provide. That is to say, he has to understand to their very root the qualities of the thing he deals in, and the means of obtaining or producing it, and he has to apply all his sagacity and energy to the producing or obtaining it in perfect state, and distributing it at the cheapest possible price where it is most needed. And because the production or obtaining of any commodity involves necessarily the agency of many lives and hands, the merchant becomes, in the course of his business, the master and governor of large masses of men in a more direct, though less confessed way, than a military officer or pastor, so that on him falls, in great part, the responsibility for the kind of life they lead, and it becomes his duty not only to be always considering how to produce what he sells in the purest and cheapest forms, but how to make the various employments involved in the production or transference of it most beneficial to the men employed. And as into these two functions requiring for their right exercise the highest intelligence as well as patience, kindness, and tact, the merchant is bound to put all his energy. So, for their just discharge, he is bound as soldier or physician is bound to give up, if need be, his life in such a way as it may be demanded of him. Two main points he has in his providing function to maintain. First, his engagements, faithfulness to engagements being the real root of all possibilities in commerce. And secondly, the perfectness and purity of the thing provided, so that rather than fail in any engagement or consent to any deterioration, adulteration, or unjust and exorbitant price of that which he provides, he is bound to meet furiously any form of distress, poverty, or labor, which may, through maintenance of these points, come upon him. Again, in his office as governor of the man employed by him, the merchant or manufacturer is invested with a distinctly paternal authority and responsibility. In most cases, a youth entering a commercial establishment is withdrawn altogether from home influence. His master must become his father, else he has, for practical and constant help, no father at hand. In all cases, the master's authority, together with the general tone and atmosphere of his business, and the character of the men with whom the youth is compelled in the course of it to associate, have more immediate and pressing weight than the home influence, and will usually neutralize it either for good or evil, so that the only means which the master has of doing justice to the man employed by him is to ask himself sternly whether he is dealing with such subordinate as he would with his own son, if compelled by circumstances to take such a position. Supposing the captain of a frigate saw it right, or were by any chance obliged to place his own son in the position of a common sailor, as he would then treat his son, he is bound always to treat every one of the men under him. So also supposing the master of a manufactory saw it right, or were by any chance obliged to place his own son in the position of an ordinary workman, as he would then treat his son, he is bound always to treat every one of his men. This is the only effective, true, or practical rule which can be given on this point of political economy. And as the captain of a ship is bound to be the last man to leave his ship in case of wreck, and to share his last crust with the sailors in case of famine, so the manufacturer, in any commercial crisis or distress, is bound to take the suffering of it with his men, and even to take more of it for himself than he allows his men to feel as a father would in a famine, shipwreck, or battle, sacrifice himself for his son. All which sounds very strange, the only real strangeness in the matter being, nevertheless, that it should so sound. 
For all this is true, and that not partially nor theoretically, but everlastingly and practically, all other doctrine than this respecting matters political being false in premises, absurd in deduction and impossible in practice, consistently with any progressive state of national life. All the life which we now possess as a nation, showing itself in the resolute denial and scorn by a few strong minds and faithful hearts of the economic principles taught to our multitudes, which principles, so far as accepted, lead straight to national destruction, respecting the modes and forms of destruction to which they lead, and, on the other hand, respecting the farther practical working of true polity, I hope, to reason farther in a following paper. End of Essay 1 unto this last.